What I hope to explain for, to you in the next 20 minutes is what we currently have, why a change needs to be made, what direct primary care is, why I think that change is valuable, and why it's going to improve the current system with quality, and finally, how it also can decrease cost. So to start off, I'd like to start by asking a question. What should the practice of medicine look like? Well, today, in the insurance-based practice of medicine, physicians are overworked. Physicians today, primary care doctors, it's very common for their practices to have 2,500 to in excess of 4,000 patients. This, as I'll explain in a minute, is a historical anomaly and very detrimental to your quality of care as, as not only patients, but then also on the legislative side as well. This results in high levels of burnout. Many people say, what do I care if my doctor's burned out? Well, if you have a doctor who runs in and out of the room, is not compassionate, I can tell you in all likelihood, you have a burned out doctor. In the United States today, we are losing approximately an entire medical school class worth of physicians to suicide every single year. That is a travesty, and something needs to be done about it. High volume results in poor quality of care. The doctor distracted by running in and out of uh, patients is not able to give them the attention that they deserve. It, we are distracted by unnecessary levels of documentation. When I was in medical school, it used to be joked that the med school students would write 10-page history and physical exams, but no one really read them. It was an academic process just to prove that you could do it and you had an understanding of what you were doing. The problem is today is that's being done by every single attending uh, level physician for every single visit. But that still stays true that no one's actually reading this. When I send my patients out for subspecialty referral and they come back, I used to have a nice narrative, I would actually learn from my specialists. Now I scour through 10 pages of meaningless notes to try to find one one sentence of valuable information. That's a waste of our time, it's a waste of their time, and it actually buries and obscures the relevant information. And that's because the, the chart has gone from being a repository of relevant medical information that facilitates communication to phys between physicians to billing, a billing and coding sheet, and it all comes down to how we pay for the system. Conflicts of interest. It's hard to imagine that in 2016, a physician can be paid more money by denying you care. Now people say, well that's crazy, that's not true, but if you actually look at a lot of these programs, pay for performance and the like, a doctor who does not order an MRI can actually get paid more than the doctor who does order the MRI, irrespective of how relevant that MRI was to the care of that patient. This is a major problem, and it creates a conflict of interest that in my opinion, destroys the sacred doctor-patient relationship the very thing we took the Hippocratic Oath to defend. Buried in bureaucracy. Physicians now have to adhere to ICD-10, CPT, Q, uh, PQRS, PEDIS, and a veritable alphabet soup of various acronym programs to monitor our performance. Well, that sounds wonderful until you realize that the more time we spend on that, the less time we spend with you as patient. And this is why. I have never found a graph that I thought more succinctly describes what has happened in the healthcare system than this one. Let me explain it quickly. So if you look down here, it doesn't show on the high screen, if you look down here, the brown line, this is the supply of physicians in the United States, essentially flat over the, the four decade period that was examined here. The yellow graph is the explosion of administrators within the healthcare system essentially a flat physician supply and exploding bureaucracy. The reason these administrators are here is because they're handling all those other tasks, PQRS, HEDIS, and all the other things. If you notice the black line, this is per capita spending. It is much more closely approximating the explosion of the administrative burden in the healthcare system than the supply of physicians. And what has this resulted in? The 800 pound gorilla that now accompanies the physician into every exam room when we see our patients. And we can't see them, but trust me, as physicians we feel them, and patients feel them too. And since he carries the piggy bank, he can dictate to the physician how fast we go, how many patients we see, and even the treatment plans. I wouldn't bring up a problem unless I thought there was a solution. And I think that solution is direct primary care. So what is direct primary care? In direct primary care, the, patient, the physician excuse me, works directly for the patient. 
This re is usually done in low cost, inclusive monthly memberships for primary care. This includes everything the doctor does. It's a wrap price. It's budgetable, it's predictable, it's affordable. Many times it's linked with major discounts on labs, imaging, and even medications. By getting the physician to work again for the patient, it means that we can have reasonable patient loads. Getting away from those 4,000 patient per doctor practices and back to more historically appropriate numbers. For those of you who don't know, prior to 1980, the average doctor in the United States had about 1,000 patients in their patient census. Nowadays, again, 2,500, 4,000 is not uncommon. So that's a historical anomaly. What else does that cause? Well, that causes accessibility problems. You're sick, you need to see your, your doctor. Who hasn't heard a story where someone says, I called my doctor and I was sick, and they said they can't get me in for three weeks? It's, those aren't just stories. That happens all the time. When I was in insurance-based practice, the same thing happened to me. We were so overloaded that we couldn't get patients in, and it caused unnecessary diversion to emergency departments. It allows for innovative delivery systems. These are the billing and coding rules, CPT and ICD-10. We have to adhere to this. This is Harrison's textbook of medicine. If you know this, you are one of the most amazing doctors ever. Our billing and coding rules have now exceeded the, de the, uh, the size of Harrison's textbook of medicine, which is essentially the Bible of medicine. Uh, we have to wait for the billing and coding systems to catch up. They still haven't recognized the telephone. We have to wait for them to create a CPT coding and billing code for that so that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, do f uh, phone calls for our patients. In a direct primary care model, we can incorporate new technology immediately. We don't have to wait for the, the bureaucratic process of figuring out how to code it. It's un unencumbered care. When people pay directly for their care, and it's affordable, they don't want to pay for unnecessary things. All the yellow that we saw before, if you knew I can pay for my medical care or I can cover a lot of administrative costs, what do you think people will voluntarily do? It cuts the fat, it gets down to uh, focusing primarily on the delivery of the care. Appropriate levels of documentation. Well, this goes back to just what I said. Do you want to pay your doctor to spend you know, an hour creating a 10-page note? Or do you want that relevant information that actually pertains to your health being documented? Less stress on the providers. Well, that's not only good for you, because it's a waste of time and money if your doctor's doing it, but it's a lot of strain on your physician, too. It leads to the burnout. Less expensive, self-explanatory, and patient-centered. Now, those of you who are involved in, in uh, drafting legislation regarding health care understand that patient-centeredness is a catchphrase that is going around a lot in healthcare communities right now, healthcare circles, patient center, medical home, and the like. But it, once you drill below the surface of every single one of those programs, it's not patient centered, it's all payment centered. When the patient is the center of what we do, they, re, 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 they return to their rightful role of being the focus of healthcare. So, what does a membership model look like? Well, in a membership model, it includes all office visits. Now this is vital. Many studies have shown that if you increase even modestly the amount of cost that the patient endure, uh, endures from seeing their doctor, they're less likely to see their doctor and they are more likely to be hospitalized. Ten years ago, studies showing just a $5 increase in copayment resulted in a $10,000 reduction in utilization but a $100,000 increase in hospitalization. So that's a legitimate problem. High deductibles, makes sense. Get the patient acting as a consumer. Problem is, they could get bitten on the back end if they're not utilizing it correctly. In direct primary care, because they've already paid for all their visits in the, in the office uh, through the membership model, if they want to come and see us, it's already covered. They wake up in the morning and say, oh, I've got this chest discomfort. I, maybe I should go see my doctor. Oh, wait, wait, that's going to be 140 bucks if I go in. Hey, you probably won't order an EKG. That's another 50 bucks. Oh, I, I'm sure this will just go away. Under this model, they're not, they're not hurt because they got sick. They come in and see us. More appropriate utilization. They come in at an earlier, more detectable level of disease. Treatment can make a difference. We do the EKG. Well, look at that. That's included, too. They don't have to worry about the additional cost. All in-office diagnostics are included. EKGs, spirometries, pulse oximeters, 
um, mono tests, strep tests, flu swabs, urinalyses, whatever it would be that we would classically do in a me membership is wrapped into the wrap price membership. You go to McDonald's, you pay more for the napkins? Of course not, it's wrapped into the price. We're not allowed to do that in medical, this allows us to do this. Also, all the in-office procedures. Need a joint injection? $300 is the average bill rate on that. That's included. Cryotherapy, ear lavage, basic biopsy, everything we do in the office, wrap price. The patient doesn't have to be fearful for accessing the care. And this is the big one, what I like to call virtual home visits. It's more commonly known as telemedicine, but I don't think that encapsulates what we're really doing. We're using the technology that is now available to essentially allow the physician to go to wherever that patient may be and deliver care. We have the telephone, email, text messaging, Skype. We're now still waiting. They, they actually do have a code for the phone call, but it is so laborious to document it to get reimbursed. No one actually charges for those. No one does them. And doctors are incredibly resistant. To, I mean, it's very, have you guys ever wondered why it's hard to get a doctor on the phone? Because they don't get compensated for that time. If they spend five hours on the phone a day, they, got, they work for five hours for free while their staff is drawing a salary, they go out of business. Under this model, it's wrapped in. And if tomorrow a new technology is introduced that allows a holographic version of their patient to pop up in front of them, we can incorporate it on day one. We don't have to wait for the billing and coding structures to cut, catch up. So imagine for a minute, sorry, it's annoyingly loud, it wasn't supposed to be, but imagine you wake up on a Saturday morning and you got an itch and you're thinking, oh God, this is terrible. I bet you I was in the garden, I bet you it's poison ivy. Oh, you know, maybe I'll wait until Monday and I can see my doctor. Wait a second, he's got 4,000 patients. This is probably going to be Wednesday at least before they get in. No, oh, this is terrible. I'll just go to the ER. Wonder this model, forget all that. Pull out your cell phone. Take a picture of it. Text it to your direct primary care doctor. Hey, doc, in the garden yesterday, got an itchy rash. Take a look. You think it's poison ivy? Why, that does look like poison ivy. Let me send some betamethasone in for you. Let me know if you're not feeling better. That's good care. Got history, got an exam, the picture, incorporates into my electric record system. Got a treatment plan, here's some betamethasone, follow up, let me know if you don't get better. It's good, it's convenient, cost effective, great for that patient, convenient, actually good for the doctor too. Very easy to do that type of care. But it's also good by giving that physician the ability to manage their sacred time resource, the ability, the ability now instead of seeing that person on Monday, and taking up a sick visit slot to give that to the truly ill person who really needed that extra time and attention. Maybe the person who just got out of the hospital, maybe you. Now you need more time than the 15, 10 minute visit that they currently uh, allocate. Now you can have a, a half an hour totally dedicated to your care. In theory, that should result in fewer rehospitalizations. All right, so this has got to be expensive. I just said it saves money, right? How much has something like this got to cost? This is uh, at the physician level itself. Remember, all your visits, all your in-office diagnostics, all the in-office procedures, virtual home visits, uh, less encumbered care, better accessibility, access to discounted meds, labs, imaging, that's got to be ludicrously expensive. Probably a lot better than you think. It can start as low as $39 a month. Now people say, how in the world can a doctor do that? Well, this is something I like to call direct primary care math. It shows under the third party payer system that we currently have today, if you bill out a dollar, there, you only collect on average around 60% of the dollar that you bill. So you have about 60 cents pay, payment on that dollar. But the collection of the 60 cents was far from free. You had to pay a lot of money to collect the 60 cents. In fact, at least an additional 40%, and I would argue that's probably an underestimate, is spent in the collection of the fee process, which means at the end of the day, you are left with about 36 cents on the dollar that was originally charged. In direct primary care, you bill a dollar. Most are set up with an automatic payment system. You have a credit card, you put it on file. Automatically, every month, it bills out exactly like a gym membership. So collection rate of that actually is pretty close to 100%. Well, that's gotta cost a lot of money to collect that, right? Well, no, it's credit card transaction fee. That's about 2%. So you're collecting 98 cents on the dollar. So it saves in other ways too. Something called opportunity cost. You all probably know what that means. The value of what you would be doing if you weren't waiting in my waiting room. 
It's not uncommon in the, in the third party based system for people to sit in a waiting room waiting for that overbooked doctor for an hour. Well, if you're seeing 30 patients a day as a physician, that means your patients wasted 30 hours every single day, every single doctor, in every single uh, uh, office in the United States. I can guarantee you that uncalculated costs of that are billions of dollars every year wasted waiting in medical offices. I don't call it a waiting room anymore. I call it the walkthrough room. Because we are allowed to schedule, we have a more reasonable patient base, our patients walk in, are greeted as they walk in, brought to the exam room where I greet them. We have essentially minimal, if any, waiting time. That's a huge value and a convenience to the patient, and a lot of those patients never have to come in in the first place because we're able to handle them through technology, not only if it's medically appropriate. We don't gonna, we're not going to commit malpractice through a phone call, but, it, but I would argue 40% of what's done in, in primary care offices under the third-party payer system could be easily handled through technology. Better access also means fewer emergency room visits. Emergency departments are the most expensive place to access care. By having primary care doctors have that accessibility, we can minimize the burnout of emergency room doctors too, which is the highest burnout group. Family docs, I'm an internist, I only see adults on primary care, but family docs went from 51% burnout in 2011 to 63% according to the AMA in 2014, three years, massive burnout because they're not doing what they love, which is taking care of patients. It's all the burden that is being thrown on them that's making them go, why did I do this? Why did I sacrifice my life to go into this once noble profession? We get incredible rates on labs. There's something called client services billing. We as a practice can get a contract with various national laboratories and get great discounted rates. When, patient, uh, when we work for the patient, we are able to pass that savings through to them. An example is a CBC, you guys know what that is? I know you do. So white blood cell count, immune cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, looks for things like anemia, platelet count, clotting cells, differential, the types of cells. It can suggest things like cancer and infection. A lot of information, build rate on that is about 88 bucks. We can get it for $2.50 for the patient at that rate. Imaging, same kind of thing. Build rate, now this is from April of last year. This is from healthcosthelper.com. The average rate in Michigan for an MRI, $3,461. When we work with imaging centers who are also thrilled to work directly for the patient, we can get MRIs for as low as $275. That's an honest price that I got on a patient for a non-contrast brain MRI. And the meds. In the state of Michigan, it's also lawful give it, if you get a special license for doctors to dispense only to their patients, but medications directly from their office. For some reason, this is used to be common. It's fallen out of favor in the last several decades. So we introduced that again. This is my office. It's an example. I have a neurologist who time shares out of, out of there. He said, oh, yeah, he didn't believe that this saved money. He goes, he pulls out his little app on his phone. He goes, I can get gabapentin, which is a nerve pain drug, anti-seizure drug. It's three times a day, 90 pills in one month's supply. He goes, I can get that for 130 bucks. I said, can you beat that? I said, sure can. I can get the exact same strip of uh, one month supply of that, $4.37. That's a savings of $125 every month on one drug alone. In that situation, we are saving them significantly more than we cost. They are essentially throwing us in for free. So just to compare the two quickly, and I know my time's running short here, uh, the, the, in the third party payer system, the physicians are overworked thousands of patients. In the direct primary care, it's historically appropriate numbers. 4,000 patients is a historical anomaly. Prior to 1980, it was about 1,000 uh, patients per physician. This, most direct primary care practices limit their, their census to less than 1,000. This goes back to the historically appropriate levels of care. Distracted, numerous distractions. The alphabet soup, as I mentioned. All the unnecessary levels of documentation. Direct primary care, minimal busy work. The doctor is focusing on you, not their, their meaningful use criteria on their computer. Conflicts of in interest, intentional. They're baked into the system. Remember, they can get paid more by denying you an MRI. That's an attempt to cut healthcare costs. Wrong way to do it. Well intended, probably. Wrong way to do it. Direct primary care, the doctor, get rid of the date gatekeeper analogy. The doctor becomes an appropriate screening mechanism. We restore to our rightful role as the advocate of the patient access, packed schedules, can't get in. 
contract, primary care, reasonable patient sent, same day, same day is the standard. Call up your doctor, sure, we'll get you in a two. Wonderful, that's well, great. Cost savings, much more expensive. That bureaucracy is not free. That yellow line was not free. You saw it in the graph. Direct to primary care, much less expensive. Primary care shortage, now this is a big one. Seeing fewer patients, that could, that could exacerbate the primary care shortage has been the argument. Why do you think the primary care shortage exists? It's because the current system does not make primary care an attractive thing from doctors. 2007 survey was done in medical students. Only 2% wanted to go into outpatient internal medicine. That's what I do. We are a dying breed. It has gotten worse since then. I don't have any updated statistics, but it has absolutely gotten worse from that. When you can show medical students primary care is fun again, it will in time resolve the primary care shortage. So pri direct primary care. Physician works for the patient. No ha billing hassle. New ways to access care. Innovative ways to save money. Less bureaucracy, less paperwork, more doctors. Direct primary care. Doctors being doctors. Brings me back to my original question. What should the practice of medicine look like? Thank you for your attention.